main complaints of doing the kinds of things that we're doing is that it's solitary and there was nowhere for anyone to go to do any kind of tinkering or you know, electronics or um, you know, sort of small scale kinetic art projects, all the sorts of things that you do in this place. And uh, we made this place so that we could all get together and do it in one room. What they're doing in a lot of cases is working on basically high-tech craft projects. When we visited, member Alicia Gibb was trying to build a pair of turn indicator armbands to wear when she's riding her bicycle. To make them work, she needed a custom-made circuit board. So Raphael helped her make it using NYC Resistor's computer-controlled milling machine. Alicia told me that this kind of collaboration is what makes NYC Resistor a great place to hang out. So in the beauty of having 50 different, different people in the group is that we have 50 different brains that we can tap into at any given point. You know, if you're if falling short a little bit in, in one type of knowledge, maybe on, you know, motors or circuit boards or something, somebody else probably knows all about motors and circuit boards, and maybe they'll come to you when they need to know something about conductive thread or... Um, LEDs or something else. Resistors members spend a lot of time just talking, working out ideas, floating crazy proposals, or just shooting the breeze. But when it's time to get to building something, the space has just about everything you might need if you're a creative hacker. If you need a laser cutter, they have a laser cutter. If you need tools, they have tools. If you need a shop, they have a shop. If you need parts, they have parts. If you need one of these, they have one of these. And lots of other stuff. Uh, when we first started, uh, most of the members, the original group of members, brought all their tools. Uh, everybody just put everything in the room together, and so that was about half of all of our electronics equipment and all of our woodshop tools and things like that. And then over the, over the last few years, we've actually bought some things, like the milling machine or the laser cutter or something like that. And it seems like a really logical thing to do in New York City especially because nobody has space in their apartment to have, you know, a lathe and a drill press and a bandsaw anyway. So if we just kind of all collectively move our big, um, you know, power tools here, then they sort of end up for communal use and everybody can use them and they're not in your apartment. A lot of the stuff they make with those tools is kind of silly. Alicia did all these electrified cakes. We would have like some of the pieces of cake would be spinning and blinking, and it might be playing a song or something. Another one of my favorite projects is the self-cleaning coffee table. Oh yeah! Which is a coffee table that has a surface that slowly moves, and it rotates once every two or three hours. So you can put things on it and do things. As long as you're there, it's fine. It doesn't seem like it's moving. But if you walk away for two hours, it's on the floor. Percentage-wise, how much of what goes on here is just goofing around and how much of it is actually serious? <laughs> Probably 80 to 90 percent is goofing around. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about right. That, that's, that's definitely what we're up, up to in this place. Yeah. We don't take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> is there something in comparison to other hacker spaces like this? Because there are spaces like this all over the country. Mm -hmm. Is there something that's particularly New York about Resistor? Uh, I'd say maybe we're the actually physically dirtier than most hacker spaces because we're in South Brooklyn. <laughs> there isn't anywhere like this in New York, and there's a lot of nerds in New York, and there's a lot of people who like to make things, and a lot of engineers, and, and or at least people with uh, engineering minds that had nowhere to go, and, and mm -hmm. that's a very important part of this place. NYC Resistor holds an open house every Thursday night. The members call it Craft Night. If you want to attend, all you need to bring with you is some good ideas. One of the most successful ideas that's ever come out of New York City's hacker community spawned a company called MakerBot. Now, a MakerBot is a kit that you build yourself, and once you've built it, you can use it to build other things. That's a little confusing. Here's what I mean. It's called a 3D printer, and it makes stuff out of plastic. Just about anything you can imagine. Here's how it works. Your computer controls a little platform that moves forward and backward and right and left, while the printer head moves up and down and squirts out melted plastic, which hardens almost immediately. When it's done, you've printed out something cool, like a bust of Beethoven or a cathedral or Stephen Colbert wearing the Capitol Dome as a hat. 
but we'll get to that in a minute. This is the MakerBot. It's a kit that costs about $1,000, which is a lot less than the 3D printers that architects and designers use. It's made in Brooklyn, and it was invented in part by this guy, Bree Pettis, at the NYC Resistor hackerspace that we visited earlier, which happens to be just upstairs from MakerBot HQ. Bree told me that the inspiration for the MakerBot was jealousy. We really wanted a 3D printer. And when we started and messing around with 3D printers, they were just too expensive. It was like $100,000 to get started. And that was just way out of our price range. But we thought, OK, let's use as many off-the-shelf parts as possible, use the tools we have at hand. We had a laser cutter. And let's see if we can you know, brute force one of these things into existence. And so we drank a lot of caffeine. The only time we weren't at the hacker space was you know, to sleep. And sometimes we slept there anyway. And we just, in about two months, just brought this thing into existence. It was born. And as soon as we got one working for a few minutes, and then it broke, we quit our jobs and threw our, and started, our, started MakerBot as a business and just started prototyping like crazy. So why did you want a 3D printer so badly, though? Well, we're tinkerers. And, you know, and we love to make things. And making something that makes things is a holy grail. It's, uh, it's like, super cool. And, and, you know, we had so many things that we could use it for. But we're, we weren't going to take no for an answer, so we just worked on it until it worked. Let's say I go to your website. I order one. What do I get? What do I have to do? All right, so a box comes in the mail that says MakerBot inside. You open it up, and it's a box full of parts. You have to put it together. The good thing is, is it's kind of like Ikea, except we have awesome, awesome instructions. <laughs> Nothing that's going to make you say, what do they mean here? Right. And the community is really vibrant. There's 5,000 of these in the world. So if you have a problem, contact support. You know, we use the same kind of little Allen keys that Ikea uses, too. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. But do I need to know how to solder? Do I need to know a lot about electronics, anything like that? You know, all you need to know is that you want a 3D printer, and you're willing to read instructions and do what it takes to put it together, and you're golden. If you haven't put together IKEA furniture, you should have a friend help you. MakerBot is not your typical tech firm. For instance, it has a visiting artist program. Jonathan Monahan was doing the residency when we visited. He told me that he's helped a lot of big-name sculptors use 3D printers to make models of their work before they set it in stone. What we've done was made sculptural designs on the computer in 3D space, and then we printed those out. And then those small models were used as maquettes, and they were sent to stone carvers. And those stone carvers were able to use, look at those maquettes and make large stone pieces um, from those maquettes. And so we had these, so we went from the digital straight to six foot granite pieces of sculpture, you know, in just a, you know, in a short amount of time. Jonathan said those experiences made him want to print out some models of his own. I was really interested in just being able to hit the print button and have physical objects of these uh, models I was already making. So what's the, what's the coolest thing that you think you've made so far? I would say it's Stephen Colbert's head on an eagle. So um, it was meeting Stephen Colbert was really cool. And uh, so we had his head and we just, you know, wanted to show some cool stuff. Okay, so there's that Stephen Colbert thing again. Jonathan showed me what he did to the Comedy Central star. First, my hair got a dusting of cornstarch to make it more visible to a 3D scanner. That's a handheld gizmo with lasers and sensors in it. He passed it around my head a few times until the computer had the picture. Then he sent that image to a MakerBot, which printed out a miniature white plastic version of my head. isn't all fun and games. The company's growing fast. It's up to more than 30 employees who do research, pack up parts, ship out the spools of raw plastic that serve as ink for the maker bots. The company's facing the same growing pains that a lot of startups do, according to founder Bree Pettis. Yeah, we keep on running into problems like we buy all the motors in the world that we need, and then we go back to buy more, and we bought them all. So we have to put, you know, we have to, we have to start, we have to find some way of getting them manufactured once that happens. So, how many of these in a week do you sell, roughly? You know, we've sold over 5,000 MakerBots at this point, and uh, I think we sell something like 10, 15 a day. 
and it just makes me so happy when I see the boxes ready to go out because with each MakerBot going out, there's going to be specialness brought into the world because of that. Creativity is going to flourish wherever that box goes. MakerBot is staying close to its hacker roots. Everything the company does, from the plans for the printer itself, to the software, to the things you can print with it, is available online for free. Companies like Apple might not want you to crack open your iPhone to see how it works or change how it works. But Brie Pettis wants you to know everything about your MakerBot and to change it if you want. The idea is called open source. If you want to modify it, you can, you know, it's made out of wood, so you can drill into it and attach a webcam if you want, or whatever kind of crazy ideas you have. Being open source means that you can hack this thing, you can make it into whatever you want, you can modify it, and, and we encourage that, and it's fun. So the theory is that by opening it up, by letting everybody sort of look inside, see the man behind the curtain, as it were, that everybody gets to improve the system. Then. So the fine details of the license means that you can make them, you can you can put you can do whatever you like with them. But if you make any changes, you also have to publish them under the same license that we have. So if you make changes, we get to learn from it, we get to improve the machine. Everybody has every, it's a party for everyone. Doesn't it also mean though that if somebody wants to build one of these without coming to you, that it's the plans are out there. They can build one, they can make it. You don't make any money then. You know, a handful of people have done that, and it takes it's, it takes a lot longer, and it takes a lot. You know, sourcing is no small feat. But everyone who's made one has given something back to the community. So they tried something a little bit different, and they shared that research back. And so the users that have bootstrapped their own MakerBot, they're oftentimes the most creative and the most giving back to the community. I've seen these things around for a little over a year now, at least in, in sort of my conscience. Um, what's the next step with them? Our big challenge right now is with the software. We're, it's, it's easy to use now, but we want it to be easier. We want it to be just, you open it up, you push a button, and it just starts making things. And we're getting there, but that's our big push right now, is developing the software so it goes from being easy to super duper easy. And Brie Pettis hopes that MakerBot's users, 5,000 strong and growing, are going to make that happen. Right, now we're going to show you a hack. We're going to make something do something that it wasn't designed to do. We're going to take this rather antiquated Xbox gaming console, and we're going to turn it into the brains of a home entertainment system. To do it, I went to my friend Matt Lorenz, a hacker who lives in Bushwick and has done this dozens of times. We started by unwrapping the Xbox that I bought online for just 60 bucks. Matt says Xboxes are great toys for hackers because they're cheap and powerful. I've gotten them anywhere for $19 at my favorite thrift store in San Diego to somebody has an extra one. They're like, hey, here, just have it. And I'd say it's great. But it's basically just a pre